Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Hilda Roche. Viewer discretion is advised. I don't have a whole lot of background information on Hilda, unfortunately, but I do know that she was born on May 7th, 1939, and I know she had at least three siblings. She was born in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, but at the time of this case, she is actually living in Alexandria in Virginia. When this case occurred, Hilda is 43 years old. She had recently gotten divorced, and she was actually working for the Department of the Army she worked in military intelligence. On the evening of March 25th, 1982, Hilda would attend a, a bar called Rafters, and she was there kind of just having a drink and mingling with people. When she was at the bar that night, she met a man, and she would later tell one of her friends, or a couple of her friends, about this man that she met. She told her friends that this guy, whose name she did not give to the friends, that he drove this really beautiful car, she described him as single, attractive, and that he had a whole bunch of money. He, he was rolling in dough. Hilda told this friend on a phone call that she planned to meet this man again and they were going to have dinner. The friend tried to kind of give some cautionary advice to Hilda as in like, hey, just, you know, be mindful because he may not be telling you the truth. This is a stranger that you met at a bar. I mean, the car could a rental vehicle. And then in terms of him saying he has a bunch of money and all the stuff he's told you, that could just be a story he made up. But Hilda said, you know, that she would be fine. And at that point, when they hung up the phone, the friend would never hear from Hilda ever again. On April 2nd, 1982, the nude body of a female was found in the woods about 150 to 200 feet away from an elementary school. This woman, who was unidentified at that time, had died from an execution-style gunshot wound to the back of her head, and there was evidence that she had also been sexually assaulted. Four days after this body is found, Hilda's friends and co-workers all reach out to police to say, we need to report her missing, we haven't seen her, we haven't heard from her, she hasn't showed up to work, she hasn't called anyone, we're worried. So police go to Hilda's townhouse, and when they get there, the door is actually kind of still open. And they announce themselves, they finally enter the townhome when they get no response. They at first notice that everything looks totally fine, there doesn't appear to be anyone there. They do find, I guess, an identification card on the coffee table, which showed the image of a woman, and her, the name on there was Hilda Roche. And the detective who looked at the ID said, I recognize this woman, like I recognized her immediately. She was our murder victim from a few days ago. So at that point, they search the house further. They go upstairs to Hilda's bedroom. The bedroom, according to them, was in disarray. There were signs of a struggle within the room. The bed sheets and comforter were all like messy. There was this some kind of binding uh, rope or, or ties or something like that next to the bed. It, it just appeared to them, now that they can say, okay, we know our murder victim, is the woman who lives in this house had been reported missing. Her bedroom looks kind of, you know, messed up here. We can now say that something started in this house, but then it ended with her murder elsewhere. There was no forced entry in the house, no broken windows, no cut screens, no doors kicked in, the locks weren't picked or anything like that. So they believe that whoever this was is someone that Hilda let into her home willingly. They did confirm later that day that their murder victim was definitely Hilda Roche. Detectives then interview Hilda's close friends and family, and this is how they find out about how Hilda had said she had met this guy at a bar, but the friends unfortunately didn't know his name. They didn't know what he really looked like. They didn't really know anything about this guy. And then, I think it's about three or so months later, they get a humongous break because the the bar that she had initially met this man at, Rafters, would reach out to police that uh, about a very unusual story. So this manager at this bar remembered Hilda interacting with this man. 
And then at one point in this, in their evening, Hilda loses her wallet. She can't find it. And so they call the manager over and it's not Hilda who asks, but it's the man who says, if you find the wallet, just call me. And that was just kind of odd because it was Hilda's wallet who was missing. But according to this manager, they do find the wallet, I guess, a couple of days later. And so she has the phone number of this person, this man that was told to you know, call him. And so she comes over and says, hey, I found the wallet. And so the man goes to the bar to pick up the wallet and the manager gives it to him. The manager at Rafters can kind of vaguely remember what the man looks like because this was, I mean, they don't find this out until three months later, but the actual event where the wallet was given back was literally within days of the murder. And so her memory of what the man looked like was kind of foggy. She didn't really know they was supposed to be looking out for this guy because no one knew of the murder at that point. So what they do is they put the manager under hypnosis and through that hypnosis, she actually remembers the phone number because she had already discarded it. And so they, they get that number and they plug it in and they kind of, they have to like transpose some numbers because she, it looks like she had remembered the numbers in, in a different order for whatever reason. While they're trying to sort through the phone number, they're also investigating other leads. The friends that had spoken to Hilda about this man said that the man claimed he worked in government contracting and that he was originally from Florida and he lived at these Oakwood apartments there in Alexandria, Virginia. And this is like an apartment complex that was pretty large. It had like 1,400 units. So they go to the apartment complex. They ask the management, hey, can we, we need to go through your releases and all your files to see if we can find anyone that matches kind of this description of this guy that might have a phone number with these numbers in it. And they have like thousands and thousands of files to, to go through. And they're combing through it all very meticulously. So they eventually whittle that down to about 32 residents of this apartment complex that might fit the bill. Then they took that phone number and they actually found a match, though the numbers that were given through this hypnosis phone number matched one particular resident of this apartment complex, a 38 year old man named Gregory Barker, who had actually moved out of those apartments just a few weeks after the murder. And he had left a forwarding address of Las Vegas, Nevada. When they get in touch with Las Vegas police and they have this address, they all find out that this guy is already gone from there. They also learned in their investigation that this guy did not do government work. He was not wealthy. This entire thing, his whole life was a fraud, basically. However, Gregory Barker was a very decorated Vietnam War veteran. He served two tours, one of them being an intelligence officer. And it seemed like there may have been a psychological break in him when he began to truly believe that he actually was some kind of like secret spy working for the government, even though he wasn't. So what they believe happened is that Gregory and Hilda likely went to Gregory's apartment the night that her wallet had disappeared from the restaurant and they may or may not have had sexual intercourse. I'm not really sure if they know that for sure or not. And then they went their separate ways. And then a couple of days later, it's believed that Gregory was called about the wallet, which he then picked up, which is confirmed by the restaurant, and that he likely went to Hilda's apartment to give her back the wallet. And then he just weaseled his way into the house, you know, under whatever pretense, and she let him in willingly. And then something happened. There may have been a violent outburst there in the apartment. Based on the fact that there were signs that she had been sexually assaulted just before her murder, he did likely rape her that night because she probably tried to turn him down. And then he raped her and then he forced her into the trunk of his vehicle. When they had his vehicle, when they finally were able to get a hold of it, they found a shoe impression inside the trunk of that car and it was a shoe impression that actually matched Hilda's shoe. And so they believe that he put her in the trunk and then drove to this secluded area, forced her to walk completely nude into this wooded empty area and forced her to her knees where he then shot her execution style in the back of her head. 
and then he took off. While looking into him, they do believe that he may fit the bill for a possible serial killer, that he may, this may not be his only victim. A lot of times in, in cases like this, where there's a sexual assault involved and the guy kind of jumps around from town to town, that is very likely the case. He was at one point kind of connected to the murder of a woman from Tucson, Arizona named Lisa Jo Shaner. She was the daughter of an FBI agent there in Arizona. Now, eventually, I'll just tell you right now that her murder was proven to be by, done by someone else. But he was connected to this murder for a brief amount of time. And that's kind of where they got this idea of like, he may have killed more people other than Hilda. Now, when he had bailed out to Las Vegas, Nevada, he had apparently committed a series of robberies there because the authorities discovered when they were investigating this and trying to find out where he was, they found out, you know, he had a forwarding address in Las Vegas. The Las Vegas police were already looking for him because of robberies he had committed. And these were armed robberies. He had been arrested for a couple of them and then was released on bond. And then he disappeared, of course. In 1991, the case airs on Unsolved Mysteries because they are pretty sure they know who did this, they just don't know where the hell he is. The very night of that broadcast, they get um, a couple of phone calls. A woman says that she recognizes the man and knows him as Alex Graham and that he had been living in Phoenix, Arizona doing some like telemarketing work. And she knows that because she works in this building with him. She never really paid a whole lot of attention to like, I guess, minor details on him. So police asked her like, like, do you know if he has a scar on his forehead? I guess that was a distinguishing mark he had. And she said, I don't really, I can't really recall actually. And then she goes into work the next day and finds out and she looks at him and goes, oh my God, he does have a scar on his forehead. And then she calls police back and says, yeah, this is the guy. So that very afternoon, the FBI gets to the office building and they arrest this Alex Graham person and they do so without incident. And he he is then identified officially as not to Alex Graham. They thought that's definitely a fake name, that this was in fact Gregory Barker. So they take his fingerprints because they do have fingerprints found in Hilda's bedroom, including on the little device that had the bindings, the string or something he used to bind her hands with, that his fingerprints were on those. And that is when they also have his car and they find shoe impression in his vehicle. I guess he doesn't clean his car ever. <laughs> so he is arrested and charged with the murder of Hilda Roche. And also he's charged with the three armed robberies from Las Vegas. In 1991, in December, he goes on trial for the armed robberies and he is found guilty. And he is sentenced to 20 years in prison. Then he is extradited back to Virginia where he is facing seeing a trial for kidnapping and murder, and he decides to plead guilty to that. He pled guilty to first degree murder, so he admitted that he did it. They had forensic evidence like fingerprints and shoe impressions and all that. They, they knew it was him. And he was sentenced to 110 years. For whatever reason, 50 of those years was going to be suspended. In 2003, he was released from federal prison for the robbery situation. Then he was sent back to Virginia, where he would begin his sentence for the murder. And at some point in prison, he died. He killed a woman and possibly killed more than that. He may have killed several women, but they'll, they really don't know for sure. They've never physically linked him to any other murder. He also committed armed robberies. He put people's lives in jeopardy for, for to steal some shit. He was a bad guy, and he, he is exactly where he should be now. Really, it's kind of all thanks to Unsolved Mysteries for airing this case as to what got this all going, as to what got finally captured this guy. And because of that, Hilda Roche got the justice she very rightfully deserved. But that is it for this case, true crime, a Rooney Dooney Dingleberry Dongs. I hope you found it interesting. Uh, as usual, if you're new here, hello, I'm Mike. I tell true crime stories here on YouTube, obviously. So please subscribe and give the video a like. And you can also follow me over on TikTok. I have a couple different pages. 
I tell short form true crime stories over there. The links to those are in the link tree in the description of this video below. The links also pop up here in this corner at some point in the beginning and at the end of the video. So feel free to check those out if you want to. Also in the link tree below, you will find my merch store. We just have like t-shirts and hoodies, nothing super fancy, but we do ship all over the entire world. So if you want to check it out. And then in my, in the description below, you'll also find my email address. If there's a case you want me to cover, just send me a really quick email just with the name of the individual, where it happened and when it happened. I will add that name to my list once I open your email. Um, I cannot promise you when I'll cover that case because I have over 6,300 names on there. I pick cases completely at random. It will happen eventually. I just can't promise you when, unfortunately. But send me a name if you want. But that is it for this video, True Crime Aroonies. So I'll end this video with a joke. I told this joke on TikTok the other day, but so this is for people who may not um, follow me on TikTok. <clears throat> okay, ready? Ready for it? You're not ready for this. This is not my original joke. I heard this somewhere else, but I thought it was, well, I thought. What did actor Hugh Laurie say when he bought everyone at a bar drinks? He said, this one's on the house. It's on the house? Yeah. Okay, that's fine. Ugh. I'm not a dad, but that was a dad joke. Okay, anyway, just whatever. It's on the house, okay? Look it up. Google it. Mm.